So welcome everyone for our race COE seminar today, um, hyperparameter tuning with ray tune. Um, hyperparameter tuning is a very huge topic. And of course, we foresee several seminars in rays that actually will address this. And very related topics like neural architecture search are basically also something we will talk about today, but which of course can fill very many different seminars. There are lots of tools out there Today, we focus a little bit on lessons learned and you know practice and experience with Raytune. But before we go into this, we also will try to really have, let's say, an understanding why hyperparameter tuning is needed and why neural architecture search is basically our way out uh, of having you know, the trouble of all this hyperparameter search that we have today. Just let me go a little bit into the agenda of today. So we will have, let's say, this welcome, and then I will talk a little bit about you know, CUE race in general and its use cases and why basically hyperparameter tuning is of relevance in the center of excellence. Then we will have a more, let's say, conceptual slash theoretical lecture because hyperparameter tuning um, relates to overfitting, relates to many different model aspects in AI, which here and there requires actually some fundamentals to look in, uh, conceptual aspects, which are very important for machine learning, like regularization, validation, these are two basically topics that without those, you basically wouldn't go for machine learning. So these are basically the topics that dis distinguish a little bit the experts from the beginners, if you want. And that's why also we have to talk about regularization parameters and validation parameters. And all of them contribute to this, let's say, sheer amount of hyperparameters. But if you then go one level more in the architecture, for instance, of deep neural networks these days, for instance, convolution neural networks or so, you find different architectures, residual networks with skip connections, you find convolutional sizes of different varieties, you have many different neurons and many different layers, et cetera, et cetera. And I will look into this a little bit conceptually, what that really means and how we can tackle this. It's a little bit related also to topics like AutoML, which some of you already are familiar with. So it's now really a clear cut between those topics. They all overlap in one way or another. And then basically at the third part of our lecture today, um, our seminar today really is then Marcel Ach. Uh, he is an expert in Jülich for basically parameter tuning for working with machine learning on HPC systems and has also gained significant experience already with Raytune and can give us some, let's say, early results in this. And then of course we have at least 20 minutes, if not more later on to have qu uh, questions and answers from you. Let me just say that, um, Basically, here is more information about the speakers. As I said, Marcel Ach is basically in Jülich, but also doctoral student in the University of Iceland, working really in large-scale machine learning. So did a lot of experience and runs with basically Horrorbot on large-scale HPC, and more recently also looking into neural architecture search, studying really what it means to have hyperparameter tuning and so forth. Shortly for myself, I teach at the University of Iceland uh, high performance computing and parallel and scalable machine learning. But I'm also the, you know, Euro HPC joint undertaking governing board member of Iceland. And, you know, more from us you find on our web pages. You actually also maybe see our brilliant new logo. Um, that is the first seminar where we introduce this. So the University of Iceland just recently had a new branding, new logo. Um, just that you're not confused from previous seminars. Um, everything is a bit more bold these days. And just observe that I still have an old logo here. Um, but, you know, that's um, just shortly the kind of hint that this seminar is kind of co-organized really with our National Competence Center uh, from the EuroCC project. Some of you are probably also involved in these. And we plan there, of course, more seminars together. And basically, the University of Iceland and the Competence Center that is hosted there is uh, very international. We have lots of foreign and Erasmus students. Uh, around like 3,000 students are alone in the kind of School of Engineering and Natural Sciences. And basically, like um, the structure of our National Competence Center is, let's say, having different simulation and data labs in different scientific domains with all different experts and PIs. I'm working a little bit in the remote sensing area there. But the interesting fact is, of course, we connect here with the Uli Supercomputing Center very much in this regard. Some of you will know that the Uli Supercomputing Center in the heart also has a simulation and data lab strategy. 
So this is something where we, of course, interact and collaborate a lot. Also, when it comes to watch access scale, um, of course, for a country like Iceland, it's very key to have, let's say, collaboration partners that can afford such a system. And we see here the Uli Supercomputing Center right now strives to get an access scale systems around 2023, 2024, with the help of the Euro HPC joint undertaking and has a very modular approach to this, which also was developed in the D projects where University of Iceland was involved, Jülich and many other partners, um, and also had a quite overlap actually of race partners that we have right now, like Partech, but also the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, for instance. Now, when you want to know more about the modular approach and the application code design that go, did rise to it, there are some references, and I don't go more into details, just shortly alluding to the Lumi supercomputer that you see here, because also Iceland is part of this consortium, which has essentially a very similar strategy. So the modules you see here in terms of the uh, modular supercomputing that we have here in Jülich with the Jubels booster, Jubels cluster and so on, you find a very similar setup in the Lumi system architecture, basically hosted in Finland, but actually paid by 10 different countries. So it's a multinational endeavor and Iceland is part of it, but also following a very modular approach. And with this, I think uh, I really welcome here everyone for the Ray seminar this time. And I will go over just shortly explaining what's the relevance really of this hyperparameter tuning. So the relevance of hyperparameter tuning is of course something where we should go into all the different use cases in detail and look at all the different models of course we don't have really time for it so I make a couple of examples here but if you want to know more about the center of excellence race and its use cases and the AI methods um, I would basically encourage you to go to this link you find a very nice website with lots of different information about the center of excellence just shortly what the idea of the center of excellence here, we basically strive towards, uh, you know, 10 to the 18 exascale, but in a way that we combine simulation sciences with AI technologies where possible and where feasible. So that means we have surrogate models that maybe can be used instead of very, let's say, computational intensive direct numerical simulations, where we hope that with a surrogate model, it's from AI, we maybe can save some computational time there by not losing too much accuracy in this model or make even larger, let's say experiments possible like wind farm modeling, which is by far these days very hard to simulate in a, let's say numerical simulation point of view. And here also there AI could help. In the end, this means we have lots of data sets that are generated, but on the other hand, of course, are then our input to our AI technologies that you see here, contributing in a way to this full loop you see here uh, that you have here. When you dig down into the details, as I said, on the website, you find much more information about this. Um, you have different compute driven use cases, uh, which are often very much in the area of computational fluid dynamics, but not only. And on the uh, data driven use cases, you find those which really have lots of data sets, lots of different data sets really, and have AI models there used for, for different purposes. And we basically take here and there some examples over the day. Um, as I am working mostly in the field of remote sensing, of course, I will take here and there examples out of those use cases. But of course, the use cases I present here will be also really relevant for all AI models, and I will make the case for it. Now, when you think about what we do in all these use cases, it's pretty obvious we have data in all of those, uh, no matter which where we're talking about, either it's the output of a, let's say, CFD simulation, um, which we then put here in an out in an input to a so-called AI model. And maybe that's a surrogate model, maybe that's something else. Uh, here in the wind farm, it might be just a wind wheel out of a basically simulation, and we try to have a surrogate model with AI. But this picture is, let's say, naive, right? So this is a high-level picture, and you would say, okay, they have one AI model, they have a little bit of data. What is the complexity in this? Now, the truth is when you look into this and when you work and know a little bit about AI, you will know that this picture is rather this, right? You see a very, let's say, um, stacked up idea of lots of lots of different AI models. And here's also where AI hits now the HPC world, where basically we have to do lots of tuning of these hyperparameters to find the right model. 
you cannot just throw an AI network, whatever it is, a convolutional network, or maybe a long short term memory network and a sequence model, so to speak, and throw it to the use cases, give it some data and you have one model. That's not how it works. Of course, you have, let's say, from experience, from literature, some AI models that actually have stand the test of time. So you would take the principal architecture, let's say, of a ResNet 50 um, and apply it. Still, there are different parameters that we will shed light on over the day, today, um, basically in the seminar, which then, um, of course, reflect the performance of these models. And this is a crucial aspect. So basically, when we talk about hyperparameters and their reality, what we really do is with all the steps that you see here and kind of messing up the simple idea of just having one AI model per use case, that's absolutely not the case. We have to find them, right? We have to find the right AI models. We maybe have more of those at work. And in the end, it's all about tuning. And that's where HPC comes in. And hence the name RayTune, you can already imagine we tuning AI models to get better and better and better. And this is an iterative process. So rarely you will just have, let's say, the first SVM with the right parameters and it just works. Just to give you the reality, what hyperparameters are in a very, let's say, 10,000 feet perspective and why it is really relevant here now, essentially for the kind of race use cases. Now, when it comes to race itself and how we try to help the use cases from the work package two perspective, that is, uh, let's say, a work package here in the COE race, which is more focused on the AI and HPC cross methods. So here we think about scaling machine learning and deep learning codes really with frameworks like Horobot or in the inner end framework that is in PyTorch. Deep speed is something what we, let's say, just recently looked in. It's not really running well these days on HPC, at least that's what I my knowledge is right now. And we investigate this. Of course, we here and there, you know, introduce in some of these use cases, relatively new AI models. Um, one example is these LSTM models for sequence data analysis which is a more, let's say, recent methods in deep learning or GRUs, gated recurrent units, which are a little bit simpler than this, just to basically understand also that not everything is just the beautiful image recognition that we know from ImageNet of, you know, identifying cats and cows. Here we talk in race really about complicated modeling. And we see in the moment that actually we have lots of different models in CU race. We also work in some of the use cases in so-called data augmentation techniques which largely stand for the fact that many of the simulation sciences or in the data intensive sciences lack, let's say the supervised or let's say data sets really that we can use for modeling. So here and there data augmentation approaches reflect the idea of you know, changing the initial data set and augment it with some varieties. Uh, good examples is rotating images, for instance, or putting a pixel in and out. These are all strategies to make your, let's say smaller data sets bigger and of course, it depends on the use cases if that works and something we also investigate. A key idea, of course, of COE race is going towards exascale. So here we try to understand this benchmarking really how far we can scale. And everybody knows in AI, scaling is not the only factor. We need to see on the accuracy values as well. We know very well that, of course, we can throw more and more GPUs to the problem. But we're also experiencing there, of course, significantly drops in accuracy. And if you're a machine learner or basically out of these use cases, you're not interested in just scaling. You also want to have the models right. So this is, of course, something which you always look at. And also the idea of pre, let's say, trained AI algorithms and networks. So applying so-called transfer learning, where you maybe have a large quantities of data for a very simple data set. You pre-train models of those. And then you take the transferred network with all the weights trained and apply them now to the use cases, which may be here and they have smaller data sets. But because the network is already pre-trained, transfer learning, as it is called, has here and there also some offs and is really good to apply in some use cases. And the topic of today really um, reflects now what we have at the last point, thinking about in the future when we have exascale performance um, that we maybe don't even think about hyperparameter tuning in a way because it would be done automatically. So one of the race, let's say aspects in our work package two philosophy is that in a way this hyperparameter tuning should be always there, right? Of course, when you explore maybe modeling and bit in the beginning, um, that doesn't need to be the case. But in the sense, when you have a production run on a very large supercomputer and you have excess scale 
performance. So you have lots of machines you can use. Chances are that you just say hyperparameter tuning, yes. And then basically we need some automated or at least semi-automated way to find the hyperparameters, to change the network architectures maybe, remove layers, introduce layers, changes the number of neurons. All of that is basically also substance of today and we will talk about this more. But of course something we have to really look into the future and reflects points to outer ML techniques. So in a way, um, what RACE does with this all in all is essentially, um, as many of you perhaps already know, striving towards something we call the unique AI framework, which is really AI at exascale methodology. So what we want to achieve is there to have a stamp on some of these technologies where we know they scale very well, or essentially have, let's say, smaller APIs and Jupyter Notebook kernels that really are able to use the different HPC systems we have in Europe. Uh, we start in the project significantly with the Uli Supercomputing Center and Barcelona Supercomputing Center and also at RTU. But um, essentially this should be of course something for the whole community. So we will try with the National Competence Center in EuroCC, but also in the EuroHPC realm that we have um, basically to, to broadening the usage of these frameworks and these key ideas. So that, you know, basically like my PhD students, when they start always having trouble with kernels, they don't fit the module infrastructure we have on the HPC systems. You have to create your own kernels. So this is all very cumbersome for people from the application domain that don't really know all the module loads and so on of particular systems, particular also when you switch between the systems, which is of course very regular because you have core hours in grants on different systems. What also is a bit reflected here in RACE, which I will later on uh, just briefly mention is of course the hardware infrastructure. We thinking about graph core, maybe in the future, so graph based systems. We have quantum computing in the systems um, that we will look at and in later parts in COE RACE. So we're not really stuck in the HPC today. So we also want to look a little bit into the future with new ideas there. Now, when it comes to um, basically understanding now a little bit the hyperparameters again, we had the fact sheet um, methodology. So we looked on these use cases and carved out the, let's say, major building blocks. And after that, we basically understanding, you know, more and more in a constant process called so-called interaction rooms. I cannot introduce these philosophies. I just show you examples and to have the YouTube channel actually of COE Race to get more about this. Here you see, two examples of fact sheets. So they capture very well the different major components where AI models are basically generated. You see here a little bit um, using traditional models like parallel support vector machines, but also deep learning models that scale with horror or deep speed. So these are just examples of fact sheets in the remote sensing domain. As I said earlier, I, I'm actually part of this community. That's why you see many examples out of those today. But here you see also the YouTube channel, which I would like to encourage you to go to. Um, in the moment, we have not all videos still uploaded. We're working on that, but very soon you have lots of videos from our previous seminars. We did monthly seminars and all of them are recorded. It's just a matter of putting them to the YouTube channel. But this seminar, as far as I know, is already there. So if you're interested in the methodology we apply in the uh, COE race, then uh, please go there. I can also say that the Admire EU project already has adopted this methodology for its use cases and for doing the application co-design approach. So it has some really good, let's say software engineering practices to play basically nicely together with the HPC community by being not too formal on the one hand, but also not let's say too much formula driven like we did much sometimes in the physics domain. So making it nicely to bridge basically to the AI domain. So all in all, what we achieved was going to all these use cases, looking at them and actually I'm trying to understand now what is essentially the idea of doing um, essentially hyperparameter tuning there. Um, we have to go really to just different models. And I think that's one of the key complexity, if you now understand just zooming in here as an example of all this you know, different use cases you see on the left-hand side that we have in COU race. And here you see the different models we apply. You see gated recurrent unit LSTMs, but also let's say autoencoders, convolutional autoencoders. We had a seminar on this also here actually in the channel, traditional shallow artificial neural networks um, or convolutional networks. So we have a wide variety of models. 
And if you want to understand the complexity and role of hyperparameters, you really have to dive in. You have to go deeper into this um, to really understand that every of these models has a certain amount of different hyperparameters, which are very essential for that particular model. And basically then a sub several of those, <clears throat> which are pretty general, right? Which are basically many of these um, neural networks share. So examples, which you can see here, is a, let's say, very trivial, let's say, convolutional neural network with 3D convolutional blocks here. And then at the end, you have this dense layers, this flattening to really then perform the classification on top. There's always an architecture, which is kind of a bold standard. But when you dive to the details, you really have to think about these um, couple of parameters here. So you see, you can actually change the layer of filter sizes. You have basically the number of neurons in the dense layer that you can change. This is maybe more a general approach, the optimizer, right? All of those uh, neural networks usually, or in more speaking in general, perhaps in machine learning, have some optimization inherent to reduce some error function or loss function. And what you see here is another parameter, um, the activation functions that you do in the different layers, the rectified linear units, um, some do leaky relus. So there are lots of different varieties of deviation functions that you can use. And a bit on my seminar, will also touch on this epochs and essentially the idea of starting to overfit if you're training too long and things like that, which basically reflects a lot of parameters. And I, I stop here to go in all the details, but the point is really to, to know these parameters, to know how many neurons you put in these different architectures is not really given to you. As I said earlier, there's some networks that stand the test of time. As I said, with ResNet 50, you have something which is already in some of the packages actually available, so you can just reuse this architecture. But then, as I said, also tuning is your friend. You really have to work on those to get better performance. And of course, this reflects a lot what we can do with HPC there. Um, it may immediately come to your mind that, hey, when we change one parameter, we have a complete different model. And when we do this, why we don't do this in parallel, right? Of course, we have parallel computing. We have lots of cores or nowadays GPUs at our disposal. So of course, here the idea is to do this in parallel. And also in my talk, I will give you some examples how beneficial that can be, especially if you think about tenfold cross-validation and, and other, let's say, typical applied aspects in machine learning. And with this, basically, just to capture a little bit what we do in the race project in this AI framework. Um, if you're interested in this, we have a deliverable on that and we can give you more information um, later on or basically in the, in when you contact us, just to basically see where this, um, you know, hyperparameter tuning in race really plays a role, which is really on the side of these deep learning packages we have right now, because almost all use cases use deep learning or let's say, these packages in one way or another. Good, I think that's all what I wanted to leave you on the table for the race project in a very particular or very, let's say, focused sense. So let's do a little bit more of an introduction to really understand all of this. And, you know, we have later on really time for questions. Uh, it basically is the best when we continue our talks and then we take all the questions at the end and come come back. So, but if you have any questions, don't forget it. Maybe write it already in the chat and we can go into that after the talk. Just before I start a short um, disclaimer also, when we talk about hyperparameter tuning and neural architecture search, these are already very advanced topics. So you will see that when you look in my outline where I have to talk about to really understand here and there these topics, you have to know a bit about machine learning. And of course, I cannot give a complete seminar now on the deep learning and machine learning on all the different algorithms I use as examples, and then talk also about the problems, uh, you know, of overfitting by we do grid search and parameter optimization and so forth. On top of it, we also want to know a little bit about neural architecture search which is in a way also already a very advanced topic in machine learning. So just saying that for those that are not really machine learning and deep learning, uh, let's say people that know some things about it, um, please go to another, let's say machine learning and deep learning tutorial first 
and then basically come to this seminar here because there will be, let's say, lots of different aspects which reflect machine learning theory, statistical learning theory, um, basically aspects of Apni Shabonenkis dimensions, model complexity, which you have to understand a little bit to really put the, the hyperparameter tuning into perspective. And in this sense, let us just start. I mean, we do a first part of this seminar, really understanding the hyperparameter tuning as a whole by doing, let's say, every, every now and then some you know, examples. We also shed here in light, of course, of the idea of using HPC. It's a seminar for COE Ray. So we also think about what HPC can bring us in. Also, I said earlier, remote sensing is my application domain. That's why you find here and there also, of course, examples out of this domain. But when I do this example, it's always carry the message that this is a very regular problem, right? It does not mean that just remote sensing applications have these problems. No matter where you go and apply AI in different application fields, you always have to do hyperparameter tuning. So there are different aspects that you have to understand with this. One is, of course, the idea again of regularization and validation, which is a very general paradigm. But then also, let's say, approaches how you can actually tackle them. The evolutionary algorithms um, that I just shortly will show you. And before we then basically go to the next big topic, really, which is this neural architecture search. And when you go to papers of this, you will see actually there are lots of publications 2020, 2021. So this is a very ongoing research. Um, this is not something where, let's say, uh, things like support vector machines have been developed in the past and are very, let's say, well understood. Neural architecture search is still very new. You would say that basically AutoML techniques are relatively overlapping with this. But in the end, um, neural architecture has some new approaches, things like instance aware neural architecture search I will shed light on, which is a bit new. And there are different ways how we can do this. And as I said earlier, also our seminar today is just picking here their pieces and put them in context of HPC, while the topic of you know neural architecture search hyperparameter tuning is very large and could fill a complete university lecture with all the different approaches. So here I would just pull one piece like reinforcement learning, and then we see basically uh, with Marcel other approaches using also very concrete tool like Raytune later on. So this should be getting you a little bit uh, into the, let's say, sphere of machine learning first. When we start here, just as a very, let's say, fast introduction, this is machine learning in terms of um, how you would approach this. You always think about there's a pattern. Hopefully, if there's no pattern, then you basically not really go for machine learning. You assume some pattern. You basically also think there's not really an exact mathematical formula for it usually. Of course, here in race, it's a little bit different. We know already some physical you know, laws or numerical methods we apply to several use cases. So there are mathematical formulas, which we in a way want to do surrogate models for. Um, but in a way, normally, you know, as a strict machine learner speaking, if you have the mathematical formula, you better go ahead and implement them. And of course, the third ingredient to machine learning is always data. It's very obvious. Machine learning means learning from data. In our case, it is often big data, which shed also you know, light on the fact that we need large computing facilities like supercomputers just to have the terabyte capacity and also the memory of the nodes to really digest and work on these. Also, on the other end of the scale, you would say as a traditional machine learner, or a data scientist using now SkyKit Learn on this HPC machines also will not really fully work because these packages like SkyKit Learn and here and there, um, the ones that are more, let's say, in the serial domain, don't really scale up very much. So hence here, the packages like TensorFlow and then combining them with Horovod, for instance, are necessary packages to come forward in this domain. So there's, let's say, quite some research of it basically getting these two fields together. And then what is basically less into, I think less intuitive for some people is that machine learning is iterative. And of course, this is now the fact, um, not only in picking different models, it's also what we had today, the hyperparameter tuning. It is maybe even feature engineering, feature selection. So aspects where you basically work on the data itself, not even on the modeling first. You have to understand maybe first in the data, what are significant features you put into the data? So you see that a little bit reflected in the so-called process called um, CRISP. 
So you understand basically what you're doing in the business understanding or scientific understanding, if you will. But it's a constant back and forth of thinking what data I really need. Then I prepare it for a specific model. Maybe do, let's say, a long vector for a typical neural network, a shallow neural network. Then I find out, oh, this shallow, shallow net neural network is not nice. So I go back to data preparation and maybe do a 2D for a convolution neural network encoding of the data. And suddenly it is much better because it captures the spatial, let's say, aspects in the data. And the long vector cannot do this, which is one of the benefits, of course, of convolution neural networks, if you know about it. But the key essence to take away is really there's not just one model that you throw on it and it's done. And with this, we have a very iterative approach to this modeling and we never know exactly what are the right parameters. We start maybe with a ResNet 50 out of the box and then we basically have to tune this type of parameters we talked about. And then we maybe think we need a complete different model. So we start from scratch with the hyperparameter tuning and, and so forth. So in a way, you can model this a little bit like this. Of course, there are many, many different other models. I capture this in my lectures usually as the so-called hypothesis set, where you have now all your, say, your toolboxes, your hypothesis as a machine learner involved, which means you can pick maybe out of the toolbox support vector machines. This is very nice material, very robust material. Um, basically, it's something where you have to understand, again, that hyperparameter tuning is reflecting reflecting also on the type of model you use. Why are support vector machines a good example in this? So basically you have support vector machines as a really robust model. You have just a couple of parameters really that are actually helping you to find the so-called margin that you see here nicely. That is basically the, the maximum margin to find the best, let's say buffer zone if you want in a classification task. So the details of support vector machines I don't want to go into, but the point is by doing so, and this is also actually possible with nonlinear, uh, let's say decision boundaries in the higher level feature space. But the point is really you have just a couple of parameters. You have maybe an RBF kernel, and then you have this kernel parameter, and you have a cost where you allow some error to happen if you maybe go over some lines. It takes more, let's say, understanding of support vector machines. And I come to this here and there in some examples, just to understand that here we have to fit just a couple of parameters while neural networks and deep learning networks have much, much more, you know, basically parameters to choose from, which brings you all of these different models, right? So of course this could be different support vector machines with different costs or different kernel parameters, but you see when deep learning, you have then suddenly, as we saw in the convolutional case, many different convolutional filter sizes. You have the number of neurons in the dense layer. That's the basically idea of the encoding in the first place of the image data differently. So there are lots of, let's say, elements in deep learning, which is much more harder to choose from. Hence for us, it's becoming now, as deep learning is quite on vogue, uh, let's say a much more hassle, also a multidimensional problem. So in the past, we did this with a kind of 2D grid, right, 10 years ago. Uh, basically, we had the 2D grid and searched one parameter space and the other parameter space. Now we have a basically multidimensional, you know, matrix or tensor, really, when you think about it. And of course, um, in the end, you, what you have to do to do this, um, it has to reflect somehow the learning mechanism you have inside. Um, and this is basically something what you apply. You have probably some error measure. You see here logistic regression in a very, let's say, trivial sense of a linear learning model, which is just another model and hypothesis to choose from. However, it also uses SGD, for instance, which is one of the optimizers still used also in machine learning. But the point is that by doing so over iteratively times and learning using some error measure, you basically knock down the error to come to hopefully some final hypothesis. And this is, of course, which hopefully gets actually the reflects the functions that maybe did creation of the data in the first place and approximates it very well. But here you have to see that within this process, now these hyperparameters play an essential role. When you change them, basically you change the whole aspect of the learning model. And it's best reflected maybe if you have this overview to, to see again all these connections and where you know the supercomputing and the data comes in and where the role of the hyperparameters are. 
you will find when you pick your toolbox, basically, as I just said, as a hypothesis said, now we have this big toolbox and we want to use report vector machines. Tomorrow we want to use shallow neural networks, ANNs. Maybe next week we use CNNs. So we have this. And for all of these, basically, always is a kind of learning algorithm that goes with it. You would say support vector machines has quadratic programming um, as basically one approach. Then you have basically neural networks have so-called backpropagation. Um, and all of them have, let's say, a different way how they do the optimization and the learning. And in the end, they also want to converge to something which hopefully approximates this function f, which stands a little bit for this unknown target function that was creating the training examples in the first place based on a certain probability distribution. This is reflected in statistical learning theory. So basically learning is only possible in a, a probabilistic sense. We call this the PAC statement in machine learning. Otherwise learning is not feasible. And basically this requires us for thinking about when we do these two together, how we change in these hyperparameters all the time. And this leads then here basically to all these different models that you see here, um, which of course can be now very computational and expensive to find. You have to think about alone training on one GPU, one model, maybe you know takes already a whole weekend for some people when they don't have, let's say, HPC or when they do it on their laptops. Now, HPC gives us lots of opportunities here. Firstly, of course, we can scale one model up. So that means we do distributed deep learning training, for instance, and using, let's say, hundreds of GPUs in parallel to actually uh, do the learning algorithm here. And basically, we had also a seminar on those if you're interested in the race channel. And the point is here, of course, this is a little bit different because we're still talking then about one model that we in parallel scale up, right? Now, of course, thinking about now that with hyperparameters tuning, we change all of these hyperparameter models um, and creating new models, really. This is something what you can do in parallel also. So you have a two level parallelization I'm talking here, right? The one is really within the model to really do distributed training, for instance, for deep learning models. The other one is you have actually this model fixed with all the parameters, but of course, then for getting the hyperparameter tuning, you want to change all of these and, and can actually execute them in parallel. Now, this sounds, again, perhaps a bit too easy because it isn't. We have to also observe these parameters and we have to observe if the validation accuracy is still OK. As I said earlier, it doesn't help us if you just scale, if the validation accuracy is actually quite dropping. And this is, of course, some limits in scaling that in CU erases also one analysis. But here you see the relevance of these hyperparameters, which have in one way or another something to do with an error measure that it really influences a lot, right? And this is a loaded subject in machine learning, which many people don't realize. It reflects, again, statistical learning theory, model complexity. Let's say you could always say, like, why I should care about this? Let's have just 600 deep layers, right? This probably can learn everything. Then you suddenly come into the idea of overfitting. The model complexity is by far too high uh, for a problem given at hand. Um, you can do the other way around. Maybe you have, a, let's say, underfitting even if the model is not really ready for the task at hand. So there are lots of, let's say, aspects which makes it not so easy to just, let's say, have any kind of deep learning network just trained long enough and deep enough to make it work. Um, also here, just shortly a side remark, in a way you have to always think that um, learning a function in machine learning is not possible because we have often the case that the same X actually gives us different Y's. And if you know in, in mathematics, that's a bad thing. It's not called a function anymore because it's not deterministic. That's why we put the probability distribution around it to say that these, let's say, you know, cases are possible again. So thinking about this overfitting, and here I really jump. So for people that are not so inclined with machine learning, I jumped now quite some bits and pieces to understand you know, this better. I really recommend to do more machine learning courses or let's say basic machine learning, because overfitting is already something which is quite an advanced topic to go to. But of course, this is exactly now where we start with the hyperparameter tuning for several different reasons just showing you that basically overfitting is a little bit defined as a time in when you train and you knock, let's say the in sample error, E in, right? That means the, the 
sample that you can actually look and observe um, on your basically hopefully final hypothesis you see here this g you knock down the error during training that's all nice in the let's say training set but when you then have so-called unseen data basically we reflect this a little bit with the out of sample data here the error out of sample from this particular machine learning function you learn um, this would be starting with a so-called generalization error very quickly when the line goes up again and this is a typical scenario you find very often that um, essentially this is a sweet spot you have to find in order to provide overfitting there are some combat mechanisms to actually deal with this problem uh, one is validation which we will talk about and the other one is regularization they have all let's say uh, different um, different ways how they treat this but um, also just to let's say be very too careful in this right to say well in the end you tell me Morris don't train long it, it, that's not the point here so because if you do let's say very less training you're in the other regime then you have bad generalization because you didn't train well enough right and of course this is a loaded subject to find exactly this sweet spot and you know there are tensor boards around that you can use as tensor board to observe these lines that also helps you a little bit to find the sweet spot but it also of course refers to different aspects in the model we will talk now about so just for model selection so that's the purpose of validation is really model selection um, in the end so how do you really do a let's say principled way of doing this because you will also see um, several different problems if you don't do it right um, one example which is often done is here essentially this this different splits in the data and that's why validation often is also thinking about a so-called validation set that has to be properly found or you do so-called fault validation approaches but you see here if you just randomly split you know basically a data set and you have let's say some degree of a polynomial you learn um, you will see with this random splits, you expose these polynomials to extremely different data sets by just randomly split it. And you see that the mean squared error here is actually varying a lot. And there's lots of theory to this. Again, I have to now talk about bias variance, trade-offs and so on, but it's not time here to do this. But in the end, what I'm talking about, you have to have a principled way to pick the data to not have, let's say, underrepresented classes or lose out some significant classes in some of the data sets and so forth. So that's why you should be careful with different, let's say, random splits. And when you think about where, let's say, validation and regularization comes in at that particular part, is really that when you think about what you want to achieve is kind of the hypothesis that we have in the error in the sample here, um, you really do some so-called overfit penalty and this is where regularization tries to estimate this quantity and I will come to this in a moment also in the more graphical perspective just to get the overview that validation and regularization are very different things but they try to combat overfitting from two let's say different angles and this is a very important point in this and the validation is essentially an estimate for out of sample performance because it will help us with model selection it will make a contamination in the data set it's a very known idea and a very known problem in machine learning really to have this so validation helps us to prevent this problem by certain different approaches we will come to in a moment but this helps us really to have a real estimate what's out there happening and this is of course a key consideration also uh, when you think about the accuracy of a model and so forth also think about it many people always think machine learning is just training and testing it's not right so basically you have lots of training going on and testing that's right but once you pick let's say a model you should do it in a validation sense for model selection so in a very particular way and that's why i brought you also a nice diagram how you do it properly if you want to do machine learning so people know about, you know, again, we have our hypothesis set, you know, basically here we take out the support vector machines the neural networks, the shallow neural network, and maybe the convolution neural network, it doesn't matter, some model. And of course, this reflects again, it could be, let's say, convolution neural networks, ResNet 50, uh, we add 10 layers, we add 10 layers, so all of this are also different models, as you know now, right? So 
this reflects now the hyperparameter aspect of it. And if you train, you basically have different models. Of course, you'd get different evaluation. But if you swim in data, of course, we would always recommend giving, you know, taking validation sets. So unfortunately, we don't always swim in data. So we can here and there, um, we basically have to get rid, let's say, of this and have our own ideas of, of joining this again or doing cross-fold um, basically approaches. But here the idea is to basically have this is validation set, this eval, which gives us the best estimate of out of sample performance, but it's not really the output, right? So this is now where we decide which to take. And that's by validation is a different entity from training and testing, right? So basically validation picks now a model. We're using this value from validation to do a human decision. By doing the human decision, we're doing a bias. Basically, we learned for the model, right? So it's not any more automatic. We as human decided. And of course, now having automated machine learning with AutoML techniques or hyperparameter tuning, which we also see with ray tune, here's now the idea that maybe it's easier when the machine will actually do this for us. But it, theoretically, we still have here this problem of doing a decision in the model that is not accounted for. And when you then basically want to train, usually you put everything back in the pot and then train the final data, uh, the final training really of this model and come to then, let's say the winner of all of those, which have hopefully the best estimated performance because you did it in a proper way with validation. So of course now finding the sweet spot of this is, is, really, um, is really hard, especially when you come to machine learning with let's say less samples where the data set is not so rich you're always in trouble of let's say picking you know how many you would put for training and how many you would put to a validation set statistical learning theory says um, with you know Vapnik Shabonenko's inequality the more training samples you have in a way is better right you need a certain amount of training to really making learning feasible on the other hand we learned of course when we want to do proper model decision we also need validation um, and validation in the end is a training of sort, but basically we need also lots of them for validation. So essentially this factor K that you see here, you really have a trouble with to pick. And of course in training, there's a nice trick that comes to this, which many of you hopefully already know, um, which is this cross validation where you try to really, let's say um, leave just one sample out, which is now the generalization of this technique, uh, where you say you basically do all the training on all the others and then come back, you know, and do this n times. So this is a little bit the theoretical assumption here, which is essentially the resampling in it. But the trick is here, you don't do basically the resampling uh, in an unsystematic way. Um, you basically do it in a very systematic way by folding it. You see this a little bit here, uh, splitting the data. But basically, um, always you know doing it in a systematic way to capture all the data set. Now you see immediately if you do it as a one fold, uh, leave one out, as it is also called, this would be a kind of very, very long endeavor, right? So you train on all except one, then you train, you know, put that in and put another out, train on all others. So here you would be having, let's say, uh, lots of lots of run. Of course, with this, you get a very good estimate also. Um, which is another benefit of this. But of course, here talking about HPC, this would be lots of different runs um, to actually go uh, to get this. Hence, of course, there are also, let's say, more applied techniques like five folds or tenfold validation techniques. And that this works is just a simple consideration here. We see, let's say, average or estimated value through all of this, where you have a cross validation error on all of these three points. When you think about how basically the model should be. You basically come here to a situation where you then count all these different errors and come to a solution um, where you basically then um, have an average of all of these models that hopefully be more robust. It will not fit the noise. It will not fit every little point very well, but on average will have a very good out of sample error. And this is now really, I mean, going relatively fast for those that are not really deep into machine learning. But of course, we don't do this for three points. We do this on the whole data set. And with this, we get a relatively good estimate of the performance out of sample. Um, and with this, you can take decisions because this is now what is interest of us, the estimate out of sample. We would say, 
Now, in this example, um, actually, what would be the better model? And it helps us to really gauge and see what would be really a better model in this particular area. And here's just an interesting approach. When you think about, I have a simple linear model, maybe a perceptron of some sort. And you know, here I have a constant model, which is my other H. And here you can see essentially before maybe fitting this or that, or this or one of these interesting linear models, perhaps indeed you can show that the constant model even wins, right? I mean, basically nobody wants really constant model. It just shows you that this basically, uh, this is kind of setup really works to take model decisions because here you see obviously in the graphic, the, the error basically is let's say on average smaller. And when this is the case, now you can really compare which model you would to choose as a human, right? Now as a human, that's a problem with it. We take the decision. We say the constant model is better. And with this, we have this stupid bias in the data, which then later on is a problem to reuse this data set again and again. So usually you should have a contaminated validation set. Once used, you throw it away. Um, of course, we can't do this here and there in the sciences. Hence, I told you this cross-validation approach is usually into practice. But this is also something which already is one of those parameters that you don't really let's say no, or you don't know what the best performance, you would assume maybe that actually leave one out might be the best estimate, but it's perhaps not always true. Then, you know, values that stand the test of time was fivefold, tenfold all the time. But these are now parameters where you already change aspects essentially of the learning process, of the variety of the data set. Right, where you learn models basically taking 10 data points or one data point into account in each, let's say, um, fold. And with this, basically, of course, um, you, you influence also how long you train, how often you train. You see that here um, very well. I think it's this kind of footprint of computing. You would say always um, you leave these out and having, of course, then through the folds, less computing in a way because you have five fold compared to one fold here. And in the practice, it's definitely recommended to do, let's say, more folds, at least at the beginning. Um, let's say tenfold is really something which is more or less a standard these days. But, you know, five folds can already make a difference. And with HPC, you're definitely able to, to basically tackle this complexity. Now, the interesting thing is now, um, when you look at these folds, you can imagine that in a way, there's also something what we could do here. And in a way, it's a parallel endeavor, right? So you could also think about even, you know, speeding up the cross-validation by doing these runs in a way in parallel, which would be kind of a third level of parallelization. You don't only scaling up one run, you scaling up the validation run. And then the third level in the end, would be then the, the different hyperparameters that you switch. By doing so, you of course have to do the, the folds also there. So basically you come now to a possibility of HPC of having three levels of parallelization. And you know, cross-validation also helps by the systematic approach um, you know, with this folding strategy and you know, through the estimated value of doing again, the training again, to capture the variance. Also, this is something in statistical learning theory where we normally would um, have a whole lecture about it. But you see here a very good example. As a summary, you see when you're just is doing this random splits in the data set, you will come to a very high um, variability and variance. When you do a systematic approach with this tenfold cross validation, as we discussed, so basically you leave you know, one data set out, train on nine, and then you put it back and train on the other nine. So basically this gives you much more lower variable invariance so that even if you have, let's say all of these different runs here um, versus different degree of polynomials, they will come to, let's say more or less equal performance. And of course, this is something which is important for us because when you report, let's say uh, to your bank, yeah, I have this particular mean squared error, which is very low, but suddenly in practice in the next run, it will be very high. It could be that actually the bank is very upset or our scientists are very upset and see you erased and don't like the model. Just some examples now, and I do this a little bit quicker because of course uh, we, we have here a seminar where we also want to have some, some practical insights and it's very, uh, let's say theoretical topic. That's why I cannot go into details and in all of this, but I think you understand hopefully a little bit the impact of this statistical learning theory with it. 
and the let's say the bias and variances. And when you now see a good example, like a support vector machine, also this would normally have two university lectures and kernel methods would be another two university lectures. So I cannot also here go into detail. I still encourage you to look at them because they still are really today applied at least for data, which is not so let's say um, big or no big data, then this is very sweet material. It finds the best line between let's say the different classes. And you see immediately here, you would say, um, this is kind of an outlier and would be very tragic if you take this by heart, right? So, and would say now here's the boundary because intuitively everybody would here probably would take rather this line, right? Because here the buffer zone, the margin, as we call that, is much bigger. So chances are that the next red point that comes in the unseen data set is right, correctly classified still. If I take this outlier by heart and now it comes to the point of noise, if I took this in the learning, let's say very strictly, I will come to this very minimum, you know, boundary that you have here with a margin that is particularly small. And immediately you see the next rot dot might be here and already automatically wrongly classified. So with this, it, it captures essentially the essence, what we do with regularization, meaning that we don't really want to have every single data point really by heart used. Now it seems contradictory to what I said before. Of course, the more data you have, the better it is. But if you have these outliers and noise in the data, what you always have, there's always noise here and there in the data sets usually. And if you take all the noise by heart, you're essentially starting to not fitting the real probably distribution or the data set, you start fitting the noise and you come to very wiggly polynomials, which usually could be maybe just a straight line. And one of these parameters in support vector machines is exactly steering this. It's the C parameter that you see here, just as an example where you can then decide, and this is one of the hyperparameters for this model, if you want to have a margin large or small. And you basically have to do this and you know pick this wisely in order to get good model performance. And you will steer that by going through different C parameters. Um, here's another approach, um, basically, where you see that similar, and so with some graphical representations that you then have also to pick the par kernel parameter a little bit differently to find, let's say, better decision boundary. But again, the details are not so important. Just to think about the complexity here that you do in data requires more or less HPC when you have different classes here, 58 classes. Maybe it's not that simple that are just shown, right, with one red and one blue. Of course, now we talk about very scientific data sets here in the remote sensing domain where you want to pixel wise identify, is it a, let's say corn, is it a soybean, grass, uh, whatever. And of course, also you have the problem that we want to do it pixel wise, not any more scene wise, right? What you know from ImageNet perhaps like, is there a cow on the picture? Is there a ship on the picture? Here we basically have the complexity of going for each pixel. And by doing so, and you see here one paper that you maybe can look into it, uh, what we did basically there is this kind of grid search, very traditional going to this kind of different parameters here on the one side, which is this kernel parameter for a radial basis function kernel. And then the C allowing more and more error to happen. And you see by steering these hyperparameters, you get different model performance in terms of accuracy rates, which you see in the first place. And then here in the brackets, you see the performance of the running time by doing it in serial with MATLAB. You also see that basically one of them is a winner, which is nice, but finding the winners, of course, not obvious. So you have to do the whole grid search in order to find those. Then you also see with the timing here, you would say 40 minutes, not that bad, but to find, of course, this best parameter set, you have to do the whole grid. And with this, you come from, let's say, nine hours with parallelization to 30 minutes, because what you can do is, of course, to parallelize this and in one place to do, let's say, every single run in parallel first level of parallelization. And then you can, of course, imagine with all the different parameters, I can do another parallelization strategy, right? And with this, I'm really for one model, maybe from 15 minutes to one minute with the inherent parallelization. And by parallelizing now the whole grid search, you basically come you know, to 35 minutes. So in a whole working day in half an hour. And here are more results in this. I don't go into the detail here, but there's the impact of HPC and high performance computing in this parameter optimization in a very, let's say, simple sense with support vector machines, which you know we'll see now with Raytune later and also with the second part of this lecture with neuroarchitecture search 
is actually much more tougher. It's much more parameters to choose from. And with this principled approach, when you then do cross-validation and so on, you basically come to this particular sweet spot. And here's a little bit more um, why that works from the evaluation data set. We have already discussed when we do this often enough, it's called the expected value that you can expect out of this validation accuracy. Um, this is something we borrow from statistics again. Luckily, we can see that it's basically um, working very well. And by putting this cross-validation, we're swallowing a little bit the bias, which is basically very small in the end because we do it just often enough. And you know the data set is very little contaminated than just using it again for completely training. So this was kind of impacts on the learning, admittedly relatively fast to get you into this problem of hyperparameter tuning and understanding it really. And thinking about that, you know, the big problem here is that this hypothesis that we take will always fit the noise, right? No matter which algorithm, stochastic data, which is you know, measurement errors or deterministic noise, which means sometimes the model is just not good enough to be you know, understanding all the data. Let's say a perceptron put into this problem we have just seen with in remote sensing, 58 classes would be really not helping. And to do this and to help there, to not fit the noise too much and to prevent overfitting, we have regularization, which really in a way puts the brakes to machine learning by doing not really every little detail in the data and every little, um, you know, kind of data set part will be you know, taken by heart. It rather penalizes the model and says, you know, I do some, some arbitrary value to it. And of course this value needs to be properly found and actually then also steered over time. And validation then is rather looking what we can expect out of sample. So basically that we have an estimate um, also some people call it the bottom line where we can you know check against and you know basically here we use here and there also this tensor board to check this with the validation accuracy. So in a way we prevent exactly this that you see on the slide. Um, when you fit the noise and would do the overfitting, it would look like this and by penalizing the model, right we come closer to the target that we really want to learn here to fit the model well um, by applying this regularization approaches. So, of course, applying regularization is not so easy as well. So you can say here, it looks quite nice. We do a little bit with a restrained fit and suddenly our, let's say free fit of a whatever n to the something uh, poly order polynomial will be suddenly, you know, just a parable or so. But of course you can also overdo it by do either too little re regularization. Then you have, let's say, um, let's say a very poor fit here and even maybe underfitting the data significantly when you do too much and to find the sweet spot parameter that you see here, this alpha um, is something which influences the learning process. It's why you see that the regularization often is within the training algorithm. We see that later as well. And by doing so, you automatically come to a point where you can you know, prevent overfitting. The other aspect, however, is um, that the model complexity, of course, usually has also something to do with it. That means if you have, let's say, just a couple of data points and you put a ResNet 50 to it, uh, the model complexity is by far too much for that. So basically here, you don't really get also proper learning and the generalization error would be also very high. And in a way it's regularization methods um, that basically help you there. Um, there are different ways of doing this, weight decay in neural networks, um, and so on, where I think we will talk later a little bit about. And this space is really something where um, you have to do lots of, um, you know, figuring out which parameters you use. For validation, luckily, there's a, let's say, um, a value, which means 20% of your data set should be kind of used, if that's possible, to split the data in this regard. One fifth for validation is often used, but it's not a guarantee. Right, and you see that here a little bit how you put that into Keras, for instance, you always have this validation split parameter that you can put there as one example. But of course, if you play with this value, you have to keep the others constant, or you basically then in hyperparameter tuning work on the others and keep that constant. So here you see already again, all of these different parameters that you have to change over time. And then when you craft neural networks, you have options like dropout, which is a regularizer. You have options like weight decay, you have different regularizers. So nobody told you that dropout will work very well. So maybe you take another one and you combine them. 
So essentially this and playing around with those is also something which we already see as hyperparameter tuning in these different models. And then basically to come also to neural architecture search a little bit um, before we talk here too long. Um, in previous times, there are also genetic algorithms and evolutionary algorithms that help us there. Particle swarm optimization is here something which does not do the whole grid search, right? Because if you have more and more parameters like we see in the neural network space, it's impossible to do basically every combination with everything. So hence there were some algorithms which would fill a complete different lecture again that actually would have, let's say, a systematic approaches to go alongside, let's say, the most optimal candidates, if you want. But this is, uh, again, just a hint for other, let's say, um, topics in this regard. Um, a summary of all of this is available in this YouTube video. I don't play that here in the light of time, of course. Just, you know, for you to really understand, again, the data contamination aspect, the validation regularization context. But let us come a little bit also to the idea of doing automated machine learning and architecture tuning, um, just by starting again on the complexities. By now, you're, I think, a little bit already understanding this. No matter where I go, which algorithm I pick in machine learning and even in data mining, we have this problem. You see here one of the work we did in the past with high performance, let's say, data mining and clustering approaches. Um, it's basically a DB scan algorithm. Um, the details is not so important for you, just it has two parameters, the absolute neighborhood and basically the number, minimum number of points you would assume in this neighborhood essentially to say it is a cluster. Now, by playing with these parameters, you get different, let's say, ideas of out of the data and all of these different applications. And there's yet another algorithm that basically needs a grid search as an example. And if you go to other pruning mechanisms, the things we have seen for trees, this is different, let's say, pruning levels of maybe doing feature selection. We have seen the idea with support vector machines. No matter where you go, you always have this problem of finding these parameters. And you can go on and go on, coming now to convolutional neural networks, where this is getting red, right? I do this on purpose. I think the, the traditional models are in a way a little bit fine. I have grid search, I can do genetic and evolutionary algorithms. But when you now come to this field of neural networks, it's getting red. So red because um, this needs HPC. You have lots of learning itself, which requires HPC and GPUs at least. But by switching all of these parameters that I already was presenting earlier, um, you have really lots of different elements to choose from and to do this let's say more in an automated fashion. And so it's of course the idea then of using some tooling, but in the end you have still a very, very big search space you have to go through. And this is no matter if it's convolutional neural networks, here's another work from us in remote sensing on auto encoders, how we use this for compressed representation. Also there the encoder and decoder structure or architecture of the network has to be found. And with this, of course, it's another, let's say set of hyperparameters to choose from. Hence, um, I, I start repeating myself from all of these models, you always have parameters, no matter where you go. Is it sequence models or you have convolutional or you would have whatever encoder decoder structures. You have some certain search space for all of these parameters and you need some certain search strategy. And this brings us to this neural architecture search. And let's say the formalization of this to pick one architecture to elaborate on this, do a performance estimation and this can inform then on the search strategy and see, you know, can we do better? So this is, of course, a kind of more practical way to do. But in a way, you see it as a large graph of executions of different architectures in a way. And of course, here, high performance computing can help us a lot. Also here to influence the search space is, of course, very important to use some prior knowledge in that. Right. So you would say um, when I know I have an image recognition problem, then probably my sequence models will not help very much, right? So here, hopefully you can influence the search space a little bit by reducing this and using prior knowledge um, to you know, remove those models, which means your search space in the end gets already very much smaller. In other words, if you have this neural architecture search and for race, there's potential of putting prior knowledge as physics, right? In some of the use cases, took a longer you know, understanding to go into the details on that people talk about physics informed machine learning, which is a little bit reflected in that, that you use your prior knowledge to influence the learning process 
and in this in that sense the search space of finding the right model so to go so um, and forward you know with this um, would be also something which much more practical actually marcel can show later i just show you here some some interesting literature aspects um, where you see that of course they have every now and then different architectures i think you can understand that by now do you have skip connections do you have let's say more or less a shallow network and by bringing in prior knowledge, you can, of course, here and there maybe influence even the architecture a little bit. But in the end, you have lots of different options. And by doing so, you always have these different parameter values alone for convolution layers, for pooling layers, for fully connected dense layers. You have lots of different elements to choose from. And of course, what you want to, let's say, explore, because all of them could be the best model. You don't know by heart. Right, so that's why it's lots of elements where you have to work, and in the end, have lots of lots of trees essentially, which are then uh, basically executing your model. And this is where some smart NAS approaches come in, because they also here and there try to reuse some already computed aspects in it. Because if you have, let's say, convolutional strategies of some sort, or so, chances are that some blocks are maybe repeating in terms of computing. But this already goes to very, let's say, specific elements. And when you want to know more about this, the survey here of machine learning research is really interesting. It's relatively recent, 2019. Since then, of course, we have still new approaches. But here we see lots of different offs. And I think the key message to take away is really um, that it works. So when you see here very different models that have been trained and tried out, and you know, just picking them as human, right? And but by performing neural architecture search in a, let's say, semi-automatic fashion, we saw basically that many of these models could be outperformed uh, depending on the number of parameters and essentially of the depth of the models. And this is an interesting takeaway message um, that really, when you go into these different publications I cite here, you see these examples that neural architecture search is, of course, something to do. On the other hand, is computational very, very complex. And there are different ways of doing neural architecture search. So we see gradient-based methods. Um, we see Bayesian optimization. Bayesian is a, basically a school in machine learning that cuts, uh, let's say, a, a whole different um, you know, way of approach before with prior and so on. But it's, uh, let's say, an interesting approach with evolutionary methods that we have already seen. So here is one idea of doing it with reinforcement learning, just as an example, which can be also used to do and influence the search strategy here, right? And in a way, they all achieve the same thing to basically try to get these architecture right. But of, you have to learn that in a sense, of course, what is your best strategy and you don't know. So hence reinforcement learning would be one way of doing it. If you know, it's basically something that we get just a grading of the output. We don't really get, you know, from the input stimulus of a data set, an output. We just get usually a grade of the output with agents, was it good, was it bad? And if you want to know more about reinforcement learning, please go to these references. I don't have time to go into much this time here. Um, and with this, you basically can have models that, you know, basically use a reinforcement idea of always, you know, getting, let's say, feedback over time through doing it iteratively through all these different models and inform essentially on the different architectures uh, over time and you know as a way of controlling see in a sequence way basically what of these different architectures are good and basically sometimes maybe even returning to some of these sequences depending on of course the reward in the reinforcement learning or the penalty and basically this would be let's say long topic but is this of course in the end means with a systematic approach of bringing this again and again, you can also maybe add and remove parts of the tree, which essentially is your you know, execution tree, also TensorFlow. If you execute deep learning models in the end, it's a graph, right? It will be compared to some graph. If you now remove parts of the graph and put it in again and do this in a systematic reinforcement you know, sequence way with this model here, um, you always get the penalties, you basically get the rewards and over time, will come to models which uh, basically are better in performance. Now, when you do this, of course, it's very much computation expensive. You have to see that you train the network again and again and again, and always with different parameters, essentially. 
And here it's a very general assumption. I think Marcel later will then pick really a couple of parameters and that's what we want to optimize for. But of course, here we talk about using basically agents and reinforcement learning do it in a complete automated fashion to switching layers, working on layers, changing the size of layers and so on. And also, of course, going into the totality details of thinking about changing maybe even the filters and the convolutional layers, the, the strides, how you go over the different, let's say, um, pixels, for instance, and so forth. So all of this shows you a little bit the complexity in this, that we need tooling for this. So there needs to be a systematic approach to get the search strategy right, to get the, all the trees right over time and to find the best parameter. And I think here it shows you very nicely that of course, for all these different aspects, again, if you think tree wise and have this controller strategy, with this different replicas of different, um, let's say, um, neural networks that you can parallelize this very well. In a sense, we talk about, again, different trees. Hence, for neural architecture search, again, basically, high-performance computing is very essential, and you can even there do lots of things in parallel. Towards the end of this, I want to just give you some insights of an instance-aware NAS approach. Um, of course, now you would think maybe the data set doesn't need one model. It could maybe have different models for different types of data. And this is, of course, one of the research areas as well by maybe using multiple networks. And the way, if you know a little bit about, you know, reinforcement learning, it needs so-called objectives to learn against. And you basically can see here that you have like two objectives types, that the task objective is, of course, something where the, the specific architecture and the accuracy is still for us very important, right? So the task at hand to classify a panda bear uh, is very important to us. We want to have this right. So this is definitely a task that we want to do right. But there might be also architecture dependent objectives. What is, let's say, uh, the whole idea of overall the data set? What is basically the best performance or basically the, the shortest time to solution? Do we classify faster maybe with another network? When you see a simpler network, you know, panda bear is quite complex with the ears and, you know, the, the eyes. Maybe a beach like here could be having a very simple network. And then we basically have, let's say, lots of computational time saved. Of course, these are basically research areas where people have tried to, to work on and where we in race also will look into what would be the best, let's say, philosophies there. Not only doing reinforcement learning, also think about maybe going again the evolutionary algorithm way and others. And of course, should also give you the light again, the pointer to this journal here with a survey. There are many, many different methods how you can actually do this. But the takeaway message here for race is almost all of them, if not all of them, can really leverage HPC. And this is a really a good takeaway message, um, just a summary of this. It is a really vibrant research field. I think here in race, we have a, let's say, very good approach for us to think about automated machine learning especially in the light of the fact that with exascale performance, we hopefully are in a situation where we don't you know, have problems with core hours anymore or GPU hours if you want, so that we automatically can turn this on. And basically then there will be a neural architecture search of some kinds basically always happening. And of course, thinking about then that you have pre-trained networks, this would be also something which is just on these machines that we can always use maybe to, to retrain our networks. So there are lots of research in this. And as I said, also, it was not really something where I directly dived into machine learning. If you want to have more fundamentals, we gave a lot of um, tutorials, Helmholtz AI, it gives now lots of tutorials in Jülich, for instance, but we also in the past have here YouTube lectures that you can look in as examples to understand this material of this lecture a bit more, because it was much more an advanced topic. Um, to improve this, here's another video I usually show to students because this is also what they like usually to have different views on the learning material this is a quite nice video video summarizing a few bits and pieces um, particularly also with optimizers we didn't touch so much rms problem adam and so forth and a master of momentum uh, putting let's say other parameters into the learning and so on but with this i think i have talked a long time to introduce this topic um, perhaps a little bit longer than i originally wanted sorry for that but we still have time enough for Marcel to really give us a practical insight and experience by using now a very concrete tool with very concrete 
um, you know, problems at hand. So thank you very much. And I think now, Marcel, I hope you're still there and not asleep and can take over. I'm here, yes. Uh, give me a second. We see the slides, perfect. Nice. Okay, um, so I will be talking a bit today about how to use hyperparameter tuning and neural architecture search um, with ray tune, ray tune in general. And then uh, at the end also present a small example of uh, running ray tune on our systems here in Jülich. <coughs> so ray in general is a universal Python API um, with a focus on distributed computing. It provides a simple primitives to run and build distributed applications. And um, one of the nice things is that uh, with Ray, it, uh, one is able to par parallelize a single machine code, single serial machine code uh, to multiple machines with very few uh, code changes. And it's also actually working uh, together with lots of different uh, Python libraries as well. Uh, Ray is open source, but uh, maintained by AnyScale, which is a company that is uh, also providing um, enterprise services related to Ray. The Ray framework uh, consists of several uh, high level um, library, libraries and broadly spoken, Ray serves as a layer to run those libraries on um, lots of different um, machines. As you can see, um, it supports basically all um, big cloud computing providers like Amazon or Google. But um, of course, you could also run it on your private cluster um, like uh, we do here in Jülich. The libraries uh, that are valuable is Raytune, um, which has a focus on the hyperparameter tuning and hyperparameter optimization. But then there's also Ray SGD, which is actually uh, a machine learning framework where you can build and train your own neural networks with. And then there is our LLIP, um, which is for distributed, um, uh, distributed reinforcement learning. So as I said, uh, Raytune uh, is specifically focusing on distributed hyperparameter tuning. Um, it works with all common machine learning uh, frameworks such as PyTorch, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, MXNet, and even Horovod. So if you have a big model or uh, a big data set where you need uh, uh, distributed uh, deep learning to train a single model, you could also combine that with Ray and uh, do your hyperparameter optimization for this distributed uh, machine learning model. Um, you can do logging via TensorBoard, um, but there are also other frameworks available. Debugging and monitoring of the resources is possible via the Ray dashboard, where you can uh, see how uh, well uh, Ray actually is, is using the resources you give it. And it's um, by default already compatible with lots of different uh, optimization algorithms. Now, the workflow of uh, Raytune is as following. So you first have to, of course, uh, set up your training. And uh, then you call the tune run function, which executes uh, the tuning. And for that, you can uh, specify two things. On the one hand, uh, you can define the uh, search algorithm. And the search algorithm tells you uh, how, how do you choose your hyperparameters in an intelligent way? But then there are also the trial scheduling algorithms that uh, tell you how to schedule those hyperparameter trials in the most efficient uh, way possible. Some algorithms that uh, are supported by Ray, uh, for example, in terms of search algorithms is uh, hyperopt search, bias opt search, but also um, all algorithms that are included with the Optuna package. So I think these are all uh, very Bayesian-based um, search algorithms. And in terms of scheduling algorithms, uh, there is Hyperband, 
There is Bob, which is Bayesian optimization combined with hyperband. Then there's Asha, uh, asynchronous successive halving, uh, which is kind of uh, like uh, the state of the art algorithm right now. Um, there's also this population based training uh, and many more. And I want to introduce these scheduling algorithms uh, a bit more now. So the, the original um, scheduling algorithm uh, was that, that was really successful is this uh, su successive halving algorithm, SHA. And um, this is based on an idea of early stopping. So you want to stop the trials uh, that have a bad performance very early on and then allocate those resources that you free up by stopping these trials uh, to more promising trials. And um, you simply do that by starting n trials. And then uh, in the first step, you kill off the lower performing half. And then uh, you do that again and again and again. And by that, of course, uh, you can use uh, the resources very efficiently. Uh, then Hyperband um, does some improvements to SHA, but uh, basically it's just a better choice for this uh, N. So it turns out that um, when you choose N equals three, so you only keep uh, like the top third uh, of the best performing trials um, that actually improves the performance as well. Then uh, with this population-based training, you start out with a random population. And um, from this population, you take the best performing trials and uh, you take them as parents and um, they generate offspring uh, via random mutation. And then you look at how these random mutations do. And again, the best performing mutations uh, get you, you put back them back in, in the pool of the population and then run another uh, algorithm. For Bob, uh, that's basically just, uh, just the hyperband algorithm again, but uh, instead for, of just choosing the new parameters uh, randomly, what you're doing is that you use some Bayesian uh, methods to find a more intelligent way of choosing uh, the new parameters. And with Asha, uh, which is, as I said, uh, currently state of the art, um, uh, you have, it's, it's very similar to SHA and Hyperband, but uh, to make it asynchronous, you do not wait uh, for all trials to reach a certain early stopping point, uh, but you do this halving or this killing off uh, of bad performing trials in a more dynamic way. And this helps you to run it uh, in a very, um, distributed parallel way, and um, uh, you can allocate uh, new resources faster. And of course, there are also um, other more simple uh, possibilities like uh, random or grid search that Noah's already mentioned, uh, and of course, also re reinforcement learning. But um, this is, in terms of computational cost, like, uh, like very, very costly, at least for reinforcement learning. A small um, quantitative comparison of these scheduling algorithms. Um, so this is actually from the uh, Asha paper. And uh, what the authors did was just run a small um, neural architecture search on the Cypher 10 data set. And what you can see here is that um, this Asha algorithm basically is uh, reaches the lowest test error. Uh, Population-based modeling is also uh, pretty good, but um, in in this use case, uh, Bob and Shah are actually uh, quite a lot worse than um, the other algorithms. Now let's take a look at how uh, Raytune uh, distributes the work. So um, at the beginning, you have to start uh, in, in your batch script, you have to start the head node. And then the head node um, launches these uh, work on, you, you also have to start the worker nodes from your batch script, but then the uh, head node connects to these uh, worker nodes and on these worker nodes, 
launches several worker processes. These are also referred to as actors. And each actor runs uh, his own instance of the function you're trying to optimize, of course, with a different um, set of parameters. And then these workers report uh, the metrics, metrics back to uh, the head node. And then uh, the head node uh, will decide to um, kill off some bad performing trials or maybe uh, continue the more promising trials then. How to integrate Ray Tune uh, into your own code. Um, this can be done, as I said, uh, with, with just a few lines uh, of code. Um, first, you need to call uh, Ray init to initialize uh, the Ray environment. Uh, then you have to define a config space, which is your um, search space. And uh, in my case, um, for example, uh, I'm, I'm defining the number of uh, convolutional layers, the number of uh, fully connected layers, and the number of filters uh, for the convolutional layers. So this would be like more of the neural architecture search task. But then also, um, I, I uh, define the, the classical hyperparameters like the batch size or the learning rate. And um, in, in Raytune, you can uh, just for example, for the number of layers, you can give uh, some discrete numbers, but of course for learning rate, we maybe want a continuous interval. Then you have to define your scheduler, the, the scheduler algorithm um, you want to run your trials with. Uh, I chose Asha in this case, and um, you have to tell which, uh, which metric you want to look out for. Um, in my case, the accuracy, and we want that to be as uh, uh, the, the best accuracy we can get. And afterwards, you just have to call tune run. You pass uh, the function uh, you want to train. You specify the uh, resources that you want to allocate to each trial, uh, the search space, and how many samples you want to sample from the um, search space. And of course, the, the scheduler algorithm, then tune uh, will run for a bit. And at the end, you don't, uh, don't forget to call uh, Ray shutdown. During uh, training, uh, Ray gives you output uh, with some information about uh, how things are going. So you can see there are some trials running here, some trials pending because they're waiting for resources. Some trials are already terminated. And then you see for each uh, trial um, the parameters that were chosen. And um, you can also watch the, the current accuracy and the current training iteration. So how far uh, the training has already progressed in terms of epochs. And for example, we can here see that Asha already terminated these trials very early on because apparently they were not uh, giving promising results. Um, now, a small um, case study of Raytune on our Jewel supercomputer here. Um, for this, I also took the Cypher 10 data set, which is quite small. It's only 150 megabytes. Um, of course, running um, hyperparameter tuning um, on a big data set is very costly. So in this case, uh, I chose to go with uh, the small data set. The goal is to find a suitable network architecture uh, together with hyperparameters, uh, again, using the ASHA schedule algorithms. And I was running this on four nodes. So this means we have uh, 16 GPUs in total. And um, I allocated one GPU per trial. Um, it's interesting with Raytune, you can actually um, run two or three or even more trials um, on a GPU. So I, I didn't try this out, but because this Cypher data set is so small, that would maybe make sense to, because like 150 megabyte is not enough to fill uh, one of these uh, NVIDIA GPUs. And I trained uh, for a maximum number of 300 epochs uh, each, each trial. 
and the total runtime of this um, of this this uh, tuning algorithm uh, was two and a half hours. So afterwards, uh, I stopped it. Uh, what we can see is that this actually seems to work. So over time, we see that uh, the accuracy uh, increases. Um, we see a steep, uh, um, a steep increase in the beginning. This is probably because this uh, search space was already chosen like in a, a good way, I would say. Like there's not, not many architectures that lead to very, very bad um, uh, results. So this explains why in the beginning uh, we have a steep increase and afterwards only uh, very small uh, fluctuations. Uh, what we can nicely see when we plot the um, a few trials over time. So on the x-axis, we have the number of steps or the, the epochs. And on the y-axis, we have the uh, time progress. So what we can see is that um, a lot of trials actually get canceled really early on. Um, they only run to 50 or maybe 100 epochs. And then only a small fraction of trials actually completes uh, the uh, 300 uh, uh, epochs. Like the, a, a few number of trials uh, only gets to train really until uh, the end. Now I want to show you some, see some um, results in whites and biases, which I used for logging. So um, this one is particularly nice. I think that maybe if you can really spend some minutes, I think that's that's really an interesting insight. Yeah. So whites and biases is also. Um, um, uh, like TensorBot, it's a logging um, tool, which you can use. And what I did here was, so especially for these neural architecture search, this is very interesting because, so here I put um, each row specifies a, um, a hyperparameter. And I have here plotted all the trials that were executed. And you can see um, when you, click on a line, for example, you see uh, the different specification or the different hyperparameters that were chosen for this run. So in this case, we choose a small batch size, uh, medium learning rates, and yeah, a huge number of filters, for example. But in the end, we see that le this leads to a very low final validation accuracy. And of course, I can also pick like the best run, the one with the highest accuracy, and I can directly see, oh, apparently a small batch size and keeping all um, uh, values uh, very um, small, just a big number of filters and a big number of layers will actually um, yield the best um, validation accuracy. Somehow, um, this is also, of course, one problem of neural architecture search that usually you have big models that uh, produce uh, the uh, the best um, output. So maybe some some other techniques here uh, would be needed to see how if we can like somehow um, reward small models. Um, but yeah, I did not do that in this case. Um, yeah, I just wanted to show this um, because I think this is really interesting um, in terms of to to visualize uh, the results you get from. Uh, uh, with this uh, whites and biases library. And I can also show a quick, uh, quick look at the Ray dashboard that I mentioned. So um, right now I only have like the head node running um, because I didn't get a, a reservation in time now on the, the Juvels computer. Um, but what you can see is uh, you can see like the uh, CPU usage. Um, if it so, this runs on the login node. But if there was like a GPU, it would also show you the GPU usage. Uh, you can see values like RAM and disk. And um, of course, you could also see the logs. So uh, in case there is like an error or something fails, 
you can um, just click on the logs and see uh, what is the error in this case. And this maybe helps you with debugging. So let's go back to the presentation. Um, a quick comparison of Raytune with other frameworks. Um, uh, you might as well know Hyperopt or Optuna, which are two other open source um, uh, algorithms. Um, maybe you also know Visor, which is the hyperparameter hyper tuning solution from uh, Google. And uh, so this figure was actually taken from the AnyScale website. And of course, they want to sell their products. So it should be taken with a, a grain of salt. Um, and I think it's also, this is wrong, like Optuna actually can run in a distributed way. It's just not, uh, it doesn't support it natively as far as I know. Um, but uh, to be fair, um, Raytune actually includes all of these other libraries. So you can uh, call the, all these other libraries from Raytune. So to be fair, um, I think it's okay to say that Raytune really has uh, most or the best uh, state-of-the-art algorithms. Yeah, quickly wrapping up things. Um, Raytune is uh, fast and easy uh, to use. It deals with uh, all the communication, all the scheduling, all the job launching in the background. You just um, need to define uh, how many workers you want, for example. Um, it has lots of different algorithms already implemented. Um, it's compatible with most machine learning frameworks, even these other hyperparameter tuning uh, frameworks. So if you have a hyperparameter tuning framework you want to use, but you want to use it in a more distributed fashion, then uh, it's maybe uh, compatible with Raytune and you could uh, like use your favorite algorithms, just put them into Raytune. Uh, it can, however, actually be a little tricky sometimes to launch it on a SNARM cluster. Um, sometimes there are small errors, um, but uh, usually it works. Um, I'm not so sure how well this multi-object optimization is working. They say they have support for it, um, but I actually haven't, haven't tried that yet. And of course, uh, we also have to check the scaling performance on a very large number of nodes. Um, this trial I ran was, of course, just four nodes, which is a very small number. Um, but maybe we can do this on the Jubilees booster in the future. That's it. I will take a look at the question now. Yeah, thank you very much, Marcel. It was a very nice overview, also very nice with the hands-on approach. I think this weights and biases is really some tool which, in a way, is, is a very nice illustration of the different pathways you have to go to the success, let's say, of one model. <laughs> but yeah, we have, uh, I think, some question. I know from Kurt, for instance, he, I think, was one of the first. What, uh, what, what do you mean by QSUB? Uh, that's something think, like I... a submission script. You know, you would basically use it to, sub, to submit your script, like Slurm does as well. Like you know, Q submit Q sub. There are different ways how you do the scheduler. You know, give the script. But I think the the question reflects to that you just do one script with the Raytune and not you know will have many different scripts and many different allocations. Yeah. Yeah, but, so uh, yeah. Exactly. That's the nice thing about Raytune. So you just specify how many worker nodes you want. So I have one head node and four worker nodes, and then you just uh, tell which scheduling algorithm you want and how much resources each trial can use. Of course, you have to make sure that you, you put like, uh, uh, like a realistic number. So if you have four GPUs per node and each trial uses one GPU, you can also only launch, like the scheduler actually automatically will only launch um, four trials on that node. So you don't have to deal with anything like it's basically just happening all automatically so i think also i would not can think of that this would work automatically right you know basically could in a way we have this chain runs on the supercomputer which is a little bit alluding to this but 
that it dynamically allocates and let's say the head gets another one and launches another one. Let's say the evolutionary thing, another child, another child, it's not possible, I think. Um, yeah, so, and also, so this was only on a slum cluster. I don't know how it works on other clusters, but I'm pretty sure that um, the, the good thing about Ray is that you don't have to worry about these scheduling manually. So that should definitely work on, on all clusters. I think in this yeah, regard, exactly. probably all works the same, I guess. Yeah, so you submit one job to the cluster and Ray does all, all the other stuff. I would call it a sub scheduling in a way for Ray, right? So you would have the main scheduling is let's say four GPUs you give to the PBS script or Slurm script, it doesn't matter really. And then Raytune looks at this resource allocation and schedules itself the runs. That's all basically a sub scheduling. Yeah. Is that right, Marcel? Yeah. I would, I would think so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Rocco asked about the uh, whites and biases integration. Um, so it's compatible. Um, you would actually, let me see if I can show you the code real quick. Um, you just uh, have to add three lines of code. And um, then of course, because uh, you, you have to use uh, whites and biases in this offline mode, um, because we don't have uh, internet connections from the um, uh, compute nodes, of course. But uh, then you, like after you run it, you sync, you, you, you sync your whites and biases folder, and then you can see the results on uh, online in your weights and biases backend. Um, let's see. So I have the code here. Yeah, in a way, it's I think more logging and profiling sense of you know looking at this, right? Like the performance analysis people would do. You basically you know lock all of the stuff and then in the end look at the results. So, yeah, this is basically all you need, I think, to uh, include whites and biases. So yeah, pretty, pretty easy, I would say. Um, other questions? Where did I put it? a small question, I think, from E-Ray, I think was yeah, one of I, the next. I, I can't find the window right now. Can you tell me the next? Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, he asks, um, which hyperparameter has the most weight to get a better accuracy? Is this also shown in Ray? Uh, I mean, that the, would... I mean, the weight is here a bit misleading. We're not talking about neural network weights. Uh, but yeah, you he you you mean like which hyperparameter? Impact. Has, yeah, the most. I think impact, he, yeah. he probably means yeah. the impact. Um, I've, yeah. So I don't think there's like an automatic way to output this. Like you would have to look at your own or run your own analysis um, to to find out about this. Um, this is probably like some. It would be some statistical analysis, I would think. Like, so you have the results from all your runs, and um, then afterwards you have to to run some some analysis on yourself to find out about this. At least that's what I think. Maybe also by looking at something like this, whites and biases bad dashboard. But um, I am I'm not sure if Ray has something integrated to uh, to present you like the, the results of the most uh, important hyperparameter. Oh, there it is. Um, so next question. Can Ray Tune work with models that include complex numbers? Uh, so by complex numbers, you mean like the like like non-real numbers? Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, I honestly don't know, but like what's in, in what what use case does 
like where, uh, where I, I just yes we we use uh, the Fourier neural operator model where we we do some FFTs and some of the uh, parameters of the model are complex and we we had a lot of issues when we tried to go to distributed to use distributed learning like Horovod or distributed data parallel I mean nothing works with complex numbers and I saw some issues that are open in GitHub and I was wondering about uh, this uh, okay yeah I would I would also have to google that um so that would be like you would have to define them in your search space. Um, uh, yeah, probably doesn't look like it supports that. Okay, I can search that myself. No, it's not an issue. Thank you. Uh, I think it's also a very, very special use case, right? <laughs> yes, it probably is. Yes. But one way you can deal with that sort of thing is split the generation of complex numbers into generate the magnitude with something like a log uniform and generate the phase with just a straight uniform over zero to two pi and then combine them yourself. Yes, that's that's uh, one approach we can try. We, we tried other things as well, but um, we, we get some issues along the way because some parts of the code are hidden. When you do back propagation, for example, there are some things that go on behind the behind what we can see and uh, we have some issues there, but maybe there is a way, but uh, yes, that we can try. Right, yeah, maybe Eric, you can also contact Andreas and discuss um, if you have interest. Um, maybe in the, in the light of the time, we are almost done with the seminar and is there any more question maybe to Marcel or me, of course? <clears throat> I don't see anything in the chat anymore, unless please speak up <laughs> if you overlook the question. Going once, twice. Okay. Right. Then, in this sense, I think I don't stretch it too long. I just share here my usual closing slides uh, with a big thanks, of course, to Marcel. Um, he really bring that to life. I think it's very important to have practical impacts. And one of the reasons why we thought we just do this Ray Tune seminar as quickly as we can so that you get some input for how maybe in all the different use cases, you know, you can do the models um, for our use cases, but of course also out there in the YouTube channel. Um, you know, if you want to know more about the race details, many of the things we left out, you have heard interesting discussion about complex numbers and use cases using them. Um, please feel free to go to our website, um, observe our, let's say, progress toward the unique AI framework. If you're interested, contact us. We definitely have more and more, I think, knowledge in this project. Today was a seminar about, I think, several important aspects in terms of hyperparameter search, by far a big space and research in the next years. So we keep you updated. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel of RACE to really get updates from our seminars and yeah, the next time we try to now do really finally the graph course seminar, we're still working on this and hopefully in November, we will have one seminar together with Atos and GraphCore. And then basically um, you get information about this from us from race as well. So finally, again, thanks to Marcel, thanks to everyone here on the call.